But I think with persecution on any level, in any place, it's good to ask where the focus is in the telling of the story. And many times those who are experiencing genuine persecution more often point away from self into Christ. They don't readily say, look at me, look at how I'm suffering. Their words and actions say more, look to the one who suffered for me. Welcome to The Blessed Podcast. I'm Nancy Guthrie, author of the newly released book, Blessed, Experiencing the Promise of the Book of Revelation. The book of Revelation begins and ends with the promise that those who hear and keep what is written in it will be blessed. And we want that blessing. So we need to hear what this book has to say to us and live in light of it. On this podcast, I'm having conversations with people who can help us to hear it, to understand its message to us, and help us to reckon with what it will mean for us to live in light of that message. My guest today is Karen Ellis. Karen, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be asked. Karen's work explores the zones where Christian endurance the African-American church experience, and theological ethics intersects. She directs the Edmiston Center for the Study of the Bible and Ethnicity at Reformed Theological Seminary, where they study Christian endurance. And I got to say, Karen, when I read endurance, I think revelation. (laughs) So Christian endurance, they study on the margins of today's society. She is currently a Ph.D. candidate in church history at Oxford Center for Mission Studies in Oxford, England. She holds a Master of Art in Religion from Westminster Theological Seminary and a Master of Fine Art from the Yale School of Drama. And I just got to say, Karen, what a variety of studies you have invested yourself in. It's amazing. Uh, Karen is an ambassador and vocal advocate for International Christian Response, which provides spiritual and material assistance to Christians who live in countries hostile to the gospel, enabling them to proclaim the truth, plant churches, and Mm. persevere. Mm -hmm. When I read Mm -hmm. persevere, once again, I think Revelation. So that leads us perfectly into talking about the book of Revelation, this call to persevere. So, Karen, right when we get started in Revelation, chapter one, Mm -hmm. it tells us it is written down by someone living under persecution. Mm -hmm. He's been exiled to Patmos, and he tells us exactly why he was exiled. He says, on account Mm -hmm. of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Here's John. He lives in a day when Caesar Mm -hmm. is called Lord and God. But John says, no, that designation is reserved Mm -hmm. for the Lord Jesus. Jesus is Lord and God. And because of that bold testimony, John has been exiled to a rocky island prison. In verse 9, John says, I, John, your brother and Mm. partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. He's writing to those seven churches in Asia in his day, but I think he's also writing to us. Mm -hmm. But perhaps those of us in the West don't think of ourselves in those terms, in those terms of facing tribulation, kingdom, patient endurance. I don't know. Do you think that's true? Sure, sure. Uh, Yeah, I think the... Well, you know, the the way we render, even just sociologically, the way we render uh, people groups as a whole kind of stands in our way. And that informs how we think about that. I think the global body as a whole actually tends to see ourselves as separated by geography and language and governments and people people groups, because that's that's the tangible, right? Um, But I'm finding that teaching on union with Christ and that the language of the body, why are we a body? Why are we in union with Christ in a body, in his body, and he refers to us as his body. Why is body language so important to the life of the Christian? And and who do we see included in that body? I think for the genuine Christian, I've always taught that the most significant number in approaching persecution, because you get a lot of statistics, you know, you get a lot of numbers, you get a lot of, um, you know, uh, numbers of people who are suffering, numbers of people who've been martyred, but the most significant number is one. (laughs) 
And for us, one is not a statistic. It's a state of being. And we're one because Christ said we should be so. Um, he offers that threefold prayer uh, to the Father in the garden um, for himself, his disciples, and to your point, for future generations of believers who are going to bear his name. So John 17 gives us some clues into the significance of our oneness. Um, and he's saying all of this in John 17 and 16 in the context of what they're going to suffer. And I think that's remarkably important. So he's telling us, listen, your oneness is connected to my life of dying and rising again, and your oneness in my body is connected to your oneness as a people. So there aren't any other temporal relationships, not on earth, not in relation to God the Father, that are based on physical and spiritual and prayer-wrought union with the entire person of Christ. Therefore, it's our primary identity. And when one part of the body in this single organism that is him, when one hurts, Paul tells us, the whole body hurts. And so we're a single organism referred to as Christ's body because he's given us his life-giving breath and body to share. So when I, when I, when I teach on that and I help people understand that um, uh, we are one, that we should, be, we should be thinking of ourselves not as the persecuted church and non-persecuted church. We think of, I tend to think of ourselves as people who live in the freer world and people who live in the restricted world but we're all one group, one body of Christians. It's not an us and them proposition. And you know, there's an interesting thing happening today that I think is really exciting. I helped, uh, I was a very small cog in the whole process, but I helped facilitate a letter of encouragement from house church pastors in one region and one language to another all the way across the world. It was uh, a group of folks in one region that has experienced hostility, anti-Christian hostility, legislated, systematized, uh, cultural, the whole nine yards. Uh, and they were writing a letter of encouragement to a group who is just beginning to experience um, the pangs of suffering for the name of Christ. And so the letter was saturated with, we know where you're about to go, and it's going to be okay. And it felt so New Testament epistle-like. I mean, we're, we're not talking about writing, you know, more canon here. Um, this is an extra biblical revelation, but it just it just reflected a reaching out across the globe that I think is unusual at this point in church history that we haven't seen in a very long time of one church writing to another across geographic lines and reminding them, we are still one. We know where you're going. We're praying for you and we are with you. Hold on just a little while longer. Everything's going to be all right. Beautiful goal. I noticed on your website, you have in really large letters, endurance. I couldn't help but note this repeated phrase in Revelation. It comes over and over again. In fact, I would define the message of Revelation as this, a call to patient endurance of suffering for our allegiance to Christ and a refusal to compromise as we wait for his kingdom to come. So let me ask you this. What does it look like today for believers to patiently endure? Of those who persevered to the end of their natural lives, two things that mark their lives. First off, an incredible vision and a commitment that results out of that vision. The second is spirit-wrought ability to endure. Some of the things that people endure are so inhumane and beyond our understanding of how a person could yield their bodies to physical pain. It really is a spirit wrought reality. So there is a supernatural aspect to it. I think they're marked by an understanding that they that their suffering has purpose and that their suffering has meaning. And that's difficult to say too, because you know we're we're talking about an incredible range of people, not just geographically today, but historically, who've had different they've had different levels of access to the word of God. So some of them don't even have 
um, some of the books that we're able to study. Uh, some of them are one day old Christians, and all they have is their faith. This is mind boggling to me. It is, right? So, you know, I think we tend to think of, um, you know, we tend to think, of course, you know, we tend to think of folks around the world, Christians around the world, experiencing and having access to the same things that we do, but many of them don't. One more thing that I would say seems to mark the testimonies and the stories that I experience and handle is an understanding of the presence of God. I love how you do Bible, Nancy. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> so, so I'm going to step into an I'm going to I'm going to step into a Guthrie moment here. But if we were to track presence from Genesis to Revelation, presence we had God's presence in the garden. And then we lost his presence and then carried the presence of God, you know, throughout the Old Testament in tabernacle form uh, and ark form. And then we get the presence of Jesus Christ coming and dwelling among men and women in in physical form, like, oh my goodness, we can touch him. We can see him with our eyes. And then he leaves us with his Holy Spirit. And then uh, we're ushered into revelation around the presence of his throne. Finally, back in the place where we were supposed to be, where we were created to be all along. And I think that those who have experienced suffering in some of the most lonely isolated situations would say that the presence of God has been one of the most significant factors of their ability to endure. Today in the West, we hear people suggest that they are beginning to experience persecution. And I know you have a worldwide perspective on that. Sometimes I'll see someone claim they're being persecuted. And I think to myself, is that really persecution or are they <laughs> is just someone just disagreeing with you or just not like mm. you? I've heard you make a differentiation between persecution and marginalization. Mm -hmm. Will you talk to us about that? Sure. This, even scripture tells us that there's a range of hostilities that uh, a believer can can experience, right? So you can experience, you know, the hostility, resentment being cast out of your families, all the way to full-blown martyrdom. And then there's a spectrum of responses in between. I've observed three groups and places where saints may be experiencing soft marginalization, persecution seekers, persecution deniers, and persecution realists. And sometimes persecution seekers exaggerate their claims or use persecution as a catch-all phrase to escape the consequences of their actions. Um, sometimes we're not being Christ-like. It's a convenient escape hatch, right? But I think with persecution on any level, in any place, it's good to ask where the focus is in the telling of the story. And many times those who are experiencing genuine persecution more often point away from self into Christ. They don't readily say, look at me, look at how I'm suffering. Their words and actions say more, look to the one who suffered for me. And that's a sort of a good, a good indication, like, hmm, who are you pointing to in your suffering? Um, other times there are overlapping identities being marginalized like in the cases of American Christian slaves who face discrimination because of their ethnicity and sometimes also their faith. There's a, a book called um, House of Bondage by Octavia V.R. Albert. She was an ethnographer in the Reconstruction period, and she went and got the testimonies of Christians who had come out of slavery who were discussing their religious freedom violations while they were enslaved. And also advocacy organizations have clear, they have to have clear parameters to know whether a demographic is experiencing legitimate anti-Christian persecution. So like uh, Open Doors defines it as any hostility experienced from the world as a result of one's identification with Christ. And then they give you the range, hostile feelings, attitudes, words, and actions, all the way to martyrdom. But then they also tell you in the Bible, persecution is defined differently. And I think that's where those of us who may be feeling soft marginalization from our families or our cultures need to kind of switch our thinking to go into places like Matthew 5, where Jesus in the, says in the Beatitudes, persecution is actually a blessing. 
Um, we don't want that necessarily, um, but he defines the word for us in Luke 6 using four verbs. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Um, note that it's Jesus in us who's the reason for and the target of persecution. Revelation has its Beatitudes as well. Seven, blessed mm. are those statements. Mm -hmm. They're centered on the same things, allegiance to Christ. Mm -hmm. When we get to the middle of Revelation, we read, mm -hmm. blessed are those yeah. who die in the Lord. It is stated in context of persecution and being put to death mm -hmm. for one's faith. So that's consistent in the book of Revelation too. Let's look into a few passages of Revelation and see what they add to this conversation. I'm thinking first about the letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. We know some of those churches were not facing persecution yet, but others were. John is told to write to the church in Smyrna, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and for 10 days you will have tribulation. He tells them to be faithful unto death mm. and that he will give them the crown of life. And I just have to say, this really goes against mm. how many of us view the Christian life in which we see prayer as a mechanism to get God to make our lives mm -hmm. easier. Mm -hmm. So we hardly know what to do with a God who is sovereign right. over our suffering. Jesus's mm -hmm. message here is not that he's going to show up and take away the suffering, which mm -hmm. isn't that so often mm -hmm. what we're hoping our, the answer to our prayer will be. Rather, his answer is that it is actually going to increase mm -hmm. for a specific amount of time that he intends. Numbers are used symbolically throughout the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. And Jesus mm -hmm. tells Smyrna that their suffering is going to last for 10 days which communicates his sovereignty mm. over the length of their suffering. And it has an end. Yes, it has an end to <laughs> yeah, it. Exactly. Praise the Lord, it has this an end. This isn't going to last forever. Right. Let me ask you, as you interact with persecuted believers, how do they wrap their heads and their hearts around a God who could <laughs> save them from death, <laughs> but instead tells them to be faithful unto death? Suffering carries an identity mark with it all throughout Scripture. There's something to that that he's like, this is the life of my people. And I think a biblical worldview understands at least two things, that the pattern of the life of Christ and the telos and purpose of suffering in the biblical economy matters. We live after the pattern of the one we follow. That's all over Scripture. We in the freer world often repeat the, well, no death, no resurrection, no resurrection, no Pentecost, no Pentecost, no power, you know, no power, no glory, and so on and so on. These saints are actually living that those phrases in real time. It's not theoretical. And your suffering has identity with born up in it, and it has meaning at the center of living costly endurance for the faith, you don't find methods or an approach to faithful living. You find that person of Jesus Christ. And he permeates and empowers the entire experience of suffering for the faith. Uh, we don't suffer for nothing. And it's almost similar to me in my mind's uh, ear to what we say about baptism. He was baptized unto us so that we could be baptized into him. We die his death to display his life, his power, and show forth his resurrection glory. This is how you will know my people. This is the life you're going to live. You're going to live like me in doing all of that. We show forth the, a sovereign God, a God who is sovereign even over our suffering and gives meaning and purpose to it. Is not the life of the disciple going to be like the life mm. of the master? Mm -hmm. We really mm -hmm. see that picture of our lives following the mm -hmm. pattern of our master, don't we? We see it, we'll see it more clearly in chapter 11. Let's look first, mm -hmm. though, at Revelation mm -hmm. chapter 6. Mm -hmm. In chapter 6, these mm -hmm. seven mm -hmm. seals begin to be opened. And when the fifth seal is opened, John sees something. He's written it down because it's mm -hmm. something the mm -hmm. believers in his day needed to see. 
And I think it's something you and I need to see. He looks and sees, we read, under the altar, the souls Mm. of those who had been slain for the word of God, for the witness that they had borne. And when I read Mm. that, it's like a picture Mm -hmm. of the reality Mm -hmm. that we Mm -hmm. read about in Romans 8, Mm -hmm. that nothing can separate us from the love of God, not famine, not sword or anything. Where are they? They're under the altar in the place of God's protective presence. So what do you think it would have meant for this first audience of this book to see this image? And what do you think it means for persecuted believers today to see it? I would think that maybe in the earliest days, and th- this is just my imagination running, but I would have I would have think they would have heard these letters and seen the faces of their immediate families. Um, their fellow servants, their loved ones under this altar. Uh, in our day, I think we would picture the same, but the size and population would be immense because of how much history has now happened. And to me, when I read those passages, it shows me that first off, those who suffer are not alone. Loneliness is huge in the suffering world, and it goes to the, the power of community and the power of us being a global body and a historical body, because the loneliness is real. I know there was a period in the 2000s where a lot of people were in the, in the um, underground churches were saying, you've forgotten us. You, we've been forgotten. Um, can you imagine? You know, how important that is for the marginalized to be seen. And the second thing it says to me is that those slain for the name of Christ, all who've been killed on the earth, 1824 says that in Revelation, all those who've been beheaded, 24, and those who refuse to bow down to the false idols of their generation, whatever they were when they experienced 1315, those people are going to be honored. And that third off, there's going to be justice. He's telling us he's working it out and he's going to keep his word as our sovereign Lord to avenge. And when righteous and true balances the scales at the end of history under the old order, all of us are going to be satisfied with his judgments. That is so much what the book of Revelation is about. In fact, we get to hear these people he sees underneath the altar. We read Mm -hmm. in chapter 6, verse 10, that they cry out, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long Mm. before you will judge Mm. and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And they're told to Mm. rest a little longer until the number Mm. of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be Mm. killed as they themselves have been. And Mm. I have to tell you, when I read that, I think... How often do my prayers ever sound like that? That's what the prayers of heaven sound like, Mm. like longing Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. God to come and set things right Mm. for those who have given their lives in allegiance Mm -hmm. to him. And so Mm -hmm. it's convicting to me in terms of the content of my own prayers. It helps to explain the rest of what we're going to read in the book of Revelation also, doesn't it? That Revelation is a picture Mm -hmm. of God saying, I'm not going to tell you how long, at least in terms that will be completely satisfying to you, but you can be sure that I will, in fact, set things right. Here's what it's going to look like. The day is going to come when you're going to celebrate Mm. my justice. You won't be embarrassed by it. Mm -hmm. Right. Karen, I think many people today, when they read about judgment in the Bible, they feel a little bit embarrassed by it. But the book of Revelation reveals actually a celebration of God's perfect justice, not embarrassment over it. In fact, a celebration that those who have slain God's people out of their hatred for God are themselves being slain in this book. Yeah, it feels like a, a massive dose of reality. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a con- again, it's a confirmation of identity as being possessed and set apart as his. And I love how they, they call out to sovereign Lord. They're not just affirming their own identity in him, but they're affirming, they're like, we know who you are. You're going to fix this. 
you know, I feel like this really harkens back again to his very words in John 16 and 17. All these things I have told you so that you will not fall away. (laughs) These things are going to happen. They're going to put you out of the synagogue. Anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God, which shows you that some of the persecution is coming from the corrupt institutional church or the temple in that day. They'll do such things because they've not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when their time comes, you'll remember what I warned you about them. So you said this is a huge dose of reality for them Mm -hmm. and for us. It's a huge dose of a Mm -hmm. bitter reality. But the fifth seal gives way to an interlude in chapter 7. That is also, I would say, a dose of reality, but actually a dose of a hopeful Mm -hmm. reality. Right. Because it's this picture of, yes, you may lose your lives in this battle, But here's who's going to be protected Mm. in the midst of this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And who will that be? Those who have been sealed to Christ. So if you are in Christ, the message of chapter 7 is that you are going to be able to stand before Christ. You'll be eternally protected because you've been marked as belonging to Christ. Yes, you may lose your life, but you will not lose your soul. It's a picture uh, that the day really is going to come when you and I Mm -hmm. will be Mm -hmm. body and soul reunited in the Mm -hmm. presence of Christ in a new creation. That's certainly what we see when we get to Revelation 21 and 22 after this great resurrection day. Now, I think to some people that Mm -hmm. just sounds like religious talk that couldn't really Mm -hmm. feed the soul and spirit Mm -hmm. to stand firm But it is what the Bible presents to us again Mm. and again to take hold of, to generate courage in us for standing firm as we look deeply Mm. into it, as we Mm. savor it Mm. and allow it to work its way through us. The Holy Spirit uses it Mm. to generate that patient endurance we need for these things. Seeing the one face to face whom you've taken by faith, that he'll be waiting to embrace us at the end (laughs) of all things has to be an incredible comfort and an amazing vindication of belief. Faith made sight. And that's stunning to me. Now let's jump to Revelation chapter 11. It gets at what I think you were talking about before in terms of identification with Mm -hmm. Jesus, our master, that we would expect Mm -hmm. the shape of our lives to take the shape of his life and that we could expect treatment from the world Mm -hmm. that hates God to be like the treatment Jesus received. In Revelation 11, John speaks of two witnesses, which I think he's talking about the church because he also describes them in terms of olive trees and lampstands which we know from earlier in Revelation, the lampstands represent the church. So it says in Revelation 11, 7 through 11, that when these witnesses have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt And of course, when we read that, we realize these are two cities that are notorious for hating God. But then it says that this is the city where their Lord was crucified, which we know was Jerusalem. So perhaps there's a reference here to Jerusalem has become that kind of city that actually hates God. It continues, for three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies. That's the dead bodies of these two witnesses and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. So there's disrespect for them here. And those who dwell on the earth, that is those who are not in Christ, will actually rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents, which says it's like a Christmas day celebration because they've killed these witnesses. Because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But then it continues that after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. 
you know, Karen, it's a picture of exactly what you were talking about, that we can expect to be treated, perhaps killed, like Jesus was treated and killed. But there's also hope presented here, the hope that we can also expect to be raised like Jesus. Our union with him is going to mean suffering now, but it's going to mean glory later. It might mean death now, but it's going to mean resurrection later. So throughout Revelation, John calls those he's writing to, to overcome, or other translations use the term conquer. But you can't help but note that in other passages, they are being conquered. And yet he describes that as actually being victory. I wonder from your interactions with persecuted people, do they use this word overcome or conquer? Do they have a sense of what victory looks like, like persevering to the end? Local congregations are dealing with a lot of the same things that we are. They're planting churches. They're living life. Um, they are living life in the, with the, you know, the undercurrent or the overcurrent sometimes of persecution, but they're planting churches, they're building schools, um, they're, they're meeting quietly, they're meeting, some are meeting publicly because they're allowed to, and they're, they're struggling with the same issues that we are. They're trying to get their um, kids educated. They're t- yes, they're living life. They're dealing with the same things that people were dealing with in the New Testament. <laughs> False teachers, corrupt teachings, sheep stealing. Making a living. Making a living, battling idols, uh, cultural idols, um, uncertain conversions, um, battling the allure of state-approved worship centers and corrupt religious institutions. In some instances, some places have slavery to deal with, and, you know, they're addressing the role of women. All of these conversations are there, and the faithful are living and navigating all of it in a hostile society that's antagonistic towards transformational biblical Christianity, uh, which provides the answer to all of those things. So it's difficult to say if that is a recurring theme or recurring leitmotif. Now, I will say that we're also seeing publishing projects come out of some closed countries where we can actually look into what they're teaching. And this is, this is huge. This is really exciting. Um, if you're familiar with um, the Center for House Church Theology, they have 10 publishing projects they're working on of bringing what is actually being taught in the pews to the rest of the world and translating them into numerous languages. And that's really exciting. So we can get a glimpse into what what actually is driving, what, what kind of teaching is sustaining them. So Karen, if one of the impacts of studying Revelation is that we are shaken out of our apathy in regard to the suffering of our brothers and sisters around the world, and we think, I want my prayers to reflect Mm -hmm. what I see in the prayers of heaven in Revelation. How might we go about learning how and what and who to pray for? As far as organizations go, um, the Edmiston Center has a number of partners that we we love that they, the fact that they're producing uh, content that we can share with our students to help them understand the dynamics of uh, living in uh, marginalized situations. The first one you already mentioned, International Christian Response USA, they're working uh, alongside church planters and providing legal aid and um, educational initiatives. Catalytic, Global Catalytic Ministries, GCM, uh, witnessing one of the largest disciple-making movements uh, in the world right now. So there are a lot to learn from them about disciple-making under hostility. Uh, help the Persecuted, fantastic organization um, supporting people in countries where Western missionaries can't go. Uh, The Center for House Church Theology, which I already mentioned, their publishing projects, I think, are going to be extremely valuable assets for understanding um, soft marginalization to martyrdom, full-blown martyrdom. And then one of our our essential partners um, is Prayer Current out of Canada. And they are re-examining prayer through the Bible, prayer that leads to... um, Leads pr- the kind of prayer that has led to the most significant revival renewal movements in history, 
and returning to um, the simplicity of New Testament style prayer and living. All of those, they're just great resources for continuing to understand our changing world. There's always some form of resentment against the gospel. It's built into it. There is an offense in the gospel. So whether that is cultural, whether it's communal, whether it's familial, or whether it's legislated and governmental, you're going to experience it somewhere, whether you live in the freer world or not. And so having these resources at your fingertips, and of course the Edmiston Center resources are going to be really helpful as we experience soft cultural marginalization in our own context. That's so helpful. I'm so grateful to have you, my sister, as my partner Mm -hmm. in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Grace and peace to you as you seek to overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Amen, dear one. Thank you so much. This has been The Blessed Podcast, a Crossway podcast hosted by Nancy Guthrie, the author of Blessed experiencing the promise of the book of Revelation. I hope you'll join me for the next episode of the Blessed Podcast as we seek to hear and keep what is written in the book of Revelation and thereby experience its promised blessedness.